ahead and bring in Steiner Sports CEO, Brandon There's Steiner. One of the country's top There's memorabilia mobile. I have an unbelievable guest, Brandon Steiner. Brandon's second to none. Hello, good morning. I, I, I don't want to waste a lot of time because this guest is so good. How good? Well, three books. It started, you know, networking is not a contact sport. This way it really grabbed my attention. We've been friends for years. Moving the needle. I'm just not sure how we're going to get through all this stuff. I mean, and this is his latest book after further review. And by the way, if you don't have a pad and pencil in front of you right now, you may want to get one because there's going to be so many golden nuggets. Joe Sweeney has been in the world of sports, but also in the world of business. And he has been all over the place. So a lot of wisdom, uh, a lot of friendship. Um, we've gone down some roads together. It's a pleasure to see you, and I'm glad you made it into New York. I'm glad you fit me in the schedule because, you know, I'm not as big as a Cardinal Dolan. I'm not as big as some of the muckety mucks you're hanging out with, and you found your way to Steiner. But, there's, you know, a lot of the people that watch and listen are going to really enjoy this conversation because you have a really cool way of breaking it down, of, of making it simple. Uh, and I think it's important, especially a lot of people that like to watch this are kind of stuck or they're kind of uh, going through something where they want to get from point A to B. And that's hopefully the goal of the conversation. Okay, Joe Sweeney, author of three books, New York Times bestseller, probably on more boards and involved with more companies. But he's here now, and thanks for joining hey, us. Thanks, first Joe. Of all, I want to tell you how grateful, honored, and humbled I am to be here. And just before we start, I've written three books, and all have a little bit of a sports theme. And the yeah. reason I have done that, I've been inspired by you, Brandon, because I've studied what you've done for the last several decades. And one of the greatest things I've learned from you is how to use the analogies from sports and apply them to uh, business and life. So I'm here to say thank you for all you've done for me. Well, Very thank grateful. you. I, I've, loved, I've loved learning from you, too. And it's amazing how similar they are. As the more you get into the sports business, you know, behind the block and tackle and the touchdown, the home run, behind it all, the same motivation, disciplines apply. So somebody just uh, LinkedIn messaged me this morning and said, you know, I played, maybe I played too much high school sports and maybe took a little bit away from my focus on maybe going to college, the kind of college I wanted to go to. I'm like, you realize how, much, how many lessons you learned right. playing on, on, on an organized high school varsity football team, basketball team? I mean, you'll use that later on. You'll be grateful and glad you had it. The similarities are, are good. Sometimes people don't look at it respectfully so, but I always look at a varsity player who's done well in school as almost like a double major. Right. Yeah. So tell me, why this book? Why? I mean, first of all, you know, I, networking is a context, but it was like mandatory reading at Steiner, by the way. Right. <laughs> and uh, the moving the needle is, is a really block and tack, a lot of basic stuff, which we'll get into. But let's talk about your latest book. Uh, after further review, why this book? How's this book come about? Well, I got to tell you, this book has been something that's been bubbling up inside of me for decades, and I finally, in your terms, had the balls to write it. You know, you're, one of my favorite books is "You Got to Have Balls." Your book. <laughs> and so, uh, full disclosure, I did a uh, four-day silent retreat about two years ago. I know that's hard for you to imagine me spending uh, four days in silence. Oh my god! But this whole book silence, came, silence. I mean, you didn't talk? Uh, uh, no, but we listened to. Um, lectures and listen to wow. to people talk but there was no talking for four days and in that four days i outlined this whole book and uh to oversimplify it it's 13 of the most important what i think life lessons or spiritual principles and since i don't have the credentials i'm not a rabbi i'm not a priest i'm just a sports business guy like you with occasional potty mouth i didn't feel i had the credentials to write this on spirituality. So I use something, Brandon, that you and I understand in 100 million people in America, the game of football. So the book starts out at an NFL football game, and when a coach doesn't like a call, this is the first chapter of the book, he throws the red flag. The stadium gets quiet, which is really important, and the official looks at the play from every different angle. And when he finally gets the call right, he turns his mic on at the 50-yard line and says three words. What are they? After, a further review, bingo. So if an NFL official could do that with the play of a football game, what if all our listeners could do that with their lives? And I'm convinced, after speaking to tens of thousands of people like you, the number one challenge we all have in our lives is we don't go into the locker room at halftime, hit the pause button, reflect on what we've done at the first and second quarter, and map out a strategy for the third and fourth quarters of our life. And you can go into halftime at 20, 50, 70, but the purpose of the book is to force the reader to go into the locker room and to realize, a great halftime experience, we realize 
we're all going to die. Our life as we know it will end. So what are we going to do between now and the time we leave this earth? And so I use 13 football analogies to communicate that. And the subtitle is How Reflection and Taking Action. This is a take action book. Um, can turn your some days into today's. And it's about how to live a full life so we don't end up on our deathbed at 88 and say, what the hell have we done for 88 years? And so it's, it's uh, the most fun I've ever had writing and speaking, and it all comes from the heart, and I'm, I'm juiced about it. It's important. Give me your best take. Give me one of your, your favorite takeaways on the book. Somebody who's going to pick up this book, what are they, what's, what's oh. one of the more, more relevant uh, points? One of my favorite chapters is, is Chapter 7. There's four quarters in a game of football. And if we hit the pause button and reflect, we realize there are four quarters in our life. First quarter, you know, you're trying to figure out what's going on. Second quarter, you get married, for most of us, have kids, work hard. Then the key thing, I think, is to go in the locker room and then really reflect on our lessons. And then you and I, Brandon, are in our third quarters of life, which I, I think, think I'm is, in the third period of a hockey game. Well, like moving into the fourth quarter. Well, but here's <laughs> I think the third quarter can be so productive because you've got 35 years of experience and you've got 35 more years of runway. And you're the type of person that will never retire. You, you'll learn to refire, and you have with this whole communications. And one of the things that's changed in our society is we've been given this longevity gift. Because if you go back 120 years, the average American male 35 or died at 47. Wow. And, you know, so, you know, it answers a lot of questions. And then even 50 years ago, people would retire at 65 and be dead by 67. People retire now at 55, 60, and they live to be 90. So the question is, what do we do with this great gift of 30 years? How do you make the adjustments like you would at halftime? It's what you, that's why you have to go into halftime. Because in our society, I think, Brandon, we do a great job of preparing us for the first half of life, how to be a doctor, a lawyer, a business person. There's virtually no training for the second half of life. And so and I think everybody in their late 40s, 50s is in this struggle mode. Does this book specifically for people in their 40s it, or 50s or it could be for anyone it could be well every author you know that's oh the book's for everybody but if i had to really focus in on the market this book is for the american male between the ages of 45 and 70 that are asking themselves every day what's next in my life what do i do and it's really to help the reader find purpose and meaning. And I know you're working yeah. on something like that. Yeah, living, uh, the new book coming out in June, Living Your Life on Purpose. Living Your Life. Yeah. So well, maybe a chapter. It's definitely hitting some nerves of it because uh, everyone is wondering, am I done? Am I, you know, people always like, Brent, you're still working? Like, yeah. like I, I've committed a crime. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Brent, you're, you're still going to work every day? Like, yeah. Well, I mean, how many days are you going to go to the beach? Or what am I? I mean, I love working. You find meaning and passion in yeah, your work. Yeah, I still like working. But, but I, I think a lot of people like working. They don't want to admit it. And then they come up with kind of an excuse of, and also a little boredom because, you know, you're doing some 20, 25 years. You need to shake it up and reinvent I think, yourself. I, I think owners and management need to realize that there's a lot, still a lot of, to be shaken off those trees with people that are a little older. And, and and if you got you got to mix it up for them, you got to change up, and it's hard when you've done something really well for 25 right. years, and all of a sudden to go and do something you're not so good at. Well, here's the last chapter. This might resonate with a lot of a lot of our listeners. The last chapter is really on death and dying, and I know most of us don't want to talk about it, but I use the analogy of pro football. It's hard to leave the game, and you know Brett Favre retired a couple different times. You know, came to the Jets, went to the Vikings, retired after he retired from Green Bay. Michael Jordan had a hard time retiring. And it's really hard in our society to retire because technically the word means to withdraw, to fade away, and to become less significant. Who the hell would sign up for that? And so what I think we can encourage all of us as we get older, don't retire, refire. Find new meaning in life. And, and part of the whole idea of it's hard to leave the game, it's because we haven't learned to let go let go of our identities. Because in America, how are we judged? We're judged by what we do and what we have. And when you no longer do, you retire and you sell your big house and you don't have the things you have, by that definition, we're a nobody. And I think that's complete BS. Because we've got this energy. Think about your life, man. All the things you've done, all the people you've employed, the value you've created for other people. And for you to go drink martinis and play golf the rest of your life, you gotta be kidding me. You will do 
this in some form or another, I think, till you leave this earth. And I hope so. I, I spent a lot of time it. in palliative care. I volunteer and talk to people on their deathbed. And people say, oh, that's so nice of you, Sweeney. To be honest, I don't do it for them. I do it for me. It's kind of a, because I learned so many lessons from them. And every time I walk away, I realize the stuff I sweat about just ain't that important. Do you believe that doing good or benevolence or helping others, how important is that? Um, well, that's basically the whole purpose of the book, Networking is a Contact Sport. Most of us think networking is you got to go out there and you got to network. And um, the whole purpose of the book is to get to, uh, people to reframe what networking is. Is And the greatest networkers, and you live this, Brandon, I say in the book, network, business, and life are places we go to give and serve and not get. In fact, when I... I, I, I got to stop here for a second. I, we saw Christine Jones the other night, right. who's a friend of ours on the Harvey McKay Roundtable. Love Christine, who uh, one of the founders of GoDaddy. She's run for a couple offices. But I remember the f we're in the Harvey McKay Roundtable together. And we were all talking about what we wanted to get out of the Harvey McKay Roundtable, what we've gotten out of it. So we're going around the room, and we're talking. It's 30 of us, and all bright, successful, yeah. tons of books. Current company excluded from you know, that comment. I mean, you know, I mean, there were you know, people that have written 8, 10, 12 books, yeah. uh, multimillionaires in the room. I mean, it was nothing short. I felt like a little pee in that room. But Christine gets up and says, you know, I think all of you are on the wrong track. It's not what you can get from this group. It's what you can value, you can give. Right. And I think it's really true in everything. I mean, you know, people don't talk enough about value, and value is what you can add and what yeah. you could do for someone or the group that, or the, your company yeah. or your team that you, your company, your team, your group can't do for themselves. Yeah. And more of that channel of thinking is critical, I think. Yeah. Not, well, not thought about enough. And that's the networking. It's like, who wants to get rid of somebody yeah. that's looking at, that's helping them, that's serving yeah. them? In fact, in the book and in my talks on networking, I rip networking. I said, I don't like it. I don't Who's want to Who's walking talk. in a room and all of a sudden everybody's coming over to you, giving their card and say, let's do business. Yeah, that's because People most of us think they like. that's the alpha male. Yeah. Male. Um, it's, so, a, it's delusional, by the yeah. way. <laughs> one of the things, and one of your favorite guys and my favorite guys is John Wooden. And on my phone and on my screensaver, next to my bed and next to my desk, I have a picture of John Wooden in the saying, and this is my favorite saying, he says, you haven't lived a perfect day until you've done something for another person who can never repay you. And I think at the end of our lives, we're going to be judged by how much did we give to others versus what did we take? Because I think, and you know this from your business, there are two types of people, givers and takers. And, um, and It's so much more fun giving anyway, but it's, it's a hard concept to get your arms wrapped around, I think. Uh, it's something I talked a lot when I get around to schools is like, don't kid yourself, you know. The, the joy is in giving. Yeah. The joy is what you can help people with. But I, th I think in this country right now, we're struggling with that concept. You know, it's, there's, there's so much focus on the money, and there's so much focus on how fast you can get it. Yeah. I'm not sure what all these kids are planning on doing after they get all this money, yeah. because they're probably going to live to like 90, 95. Yeah. So I think, you know, the, the, the master plan, the strategy, has to be more than just being successful and making a few bucks. Yeah. But I think part of it, too, is everything is happening so fast with technology that we've got instant gratification is what most of us want. Yeah, of and course. I joke is that instant yeah. gratification isn't fast enough for a lot of us. <laughs> so, but I, I think, and again, the purpose of this book, the third book, is to really get you to stop and reflect. And, and that's hard to do in the first and second quarter because we're going so fast. And a lot of us never stop. Now, Lou Holtz did the forward. Yeah, Lou is great. Coach no, Lou Holtz no, is no, one of the great Friends of both of ours. What did you learn from Lou? Um, well, Lou, when I called Lou and asked him if he'd help with the forward, um, he said, send me some thoughts, tell me about the book. He called me back in 15 minutes and said, Sween, I'll do it for you. And I said, Coach, I am so grateful for this. And Brandon and I had dinner with Lou Holtz several times in Phoenix, and the last time I was with Coach Holtz, he gave me his card and said, Joe, if there's anything I can ever do for you or your family, let me know. Now you and, figured he was just bullshit. I, I yeah. Thought, yeah. And then when, when uh, I, I told him how grateful I was, he said, do you remember what I said when we left? And I said, yeah. And I repeated it. And he said, Lou Holtz means what he says. He's one of the greatest guys and most inspirational people I've ever been around. Outside of you, Brandon, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're talking with Joe Sweeney, his new book, After Further Review. But also, if, I, I mean, I love all your books, but this this was a game changer for Steiner. You know, we had you come up here and do a talk all about networking because I think people get on the wrong track sometimes about 
how to meet people. And obviously, the the rope, the big boy game, the grown up game, is really relationships and more about think about what you can do for someone else before right. you start walking in and figuring out what they're going to do for you. But most people, the dollar signs, like, can I make that big sale? If you have any questions, uh, email them in. We're going to keep this conversation going. If you want to talk with Joe any, about any of his books. Also, we'll give away a couple of these books as, as well later. Um, anybody put some comments on there? Or if you've read this book, you have anything about Joe, Joe, please. There's a participation sport here. Jump in. Don't hesitate. Um, You've been through a lot of ups and downs. You've done M&A. You're on some different boards. Tell Only me how the tell me companies. how the transition went for you because you know you worked in the sports marketing business, right. worked with some pretty big names, right. and that's probably a big hill to jump off of to just all of a sudden change up, start writing books, speaking. Right. How'd you go through the transition? Well, I think how hard was it? Um, I think transitions are always hard because I think sometimes. Um, to learn a new industry, to learn new people. And this is for some of the young entrepreneurs that are listening in here. I think a lot of it is, and, and actually it's why I wrote the second book, Moving the Needle, is when you're stuck in life or you don't know what's next, I think there's three things that stop us from moving the needle. It's an inability to get clear. Clarity is a key thing. It's an inab inability to get free. And then the third thing, sometimes we just need the tools to get going. So I wrote the book, Moving the Needle, Get Clear, Get Free, and Get Going in Your Career you Business. I mean, you know, all of a sudden, if you're working a job or if you're just coming out of college and you're trying to move the needle, I mean, you got pressured. All of a sudden, your parents need you want you to work. You got to repay the school loans. Payments. I mean, how, how do you get past that? Yeah. Or if you've worked in 20 years, you got a family, they're counting on you to make a living, but you, you're bored, you're tired, you don't want to do this yeah. anymore. Yeah, that's a challenge. That's a real challenge. But here's one of the things. I have a formula in this book. If you're thinking, if you're where, I mean, you're not, I think, you know, one of the most important things when we talk about clarity is realize that we're all unique individuals, but the situations we're in, you're not alone. Like, right. everybody's going through the same, same stuff. Thing. Yeah. You know, everybody goes through the, the pressure when you get out of school. Are you reaching your, your potential? Yeah. You spent all this money on college. Or if you're 50 and all of a sudden you're doing some 25 years, you made a good living, how do you now swap over and go play in a rock and roll band or, you know, whatever it is you want to yeah. do? I mean, see, I, I would, and again, I'm not trying to throw spears at, at people or organizations, but I think our education system sucks. Well, what we do. I'll throw the spears. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean it's a, it doesn't suck, but it's off. It's off. It's off. And here's why. We focus so much teaching our young students about chemistry, about commerce, about law. We spend very little time, virtually none, how to live a good life. And so we're trying to learn this uh, accounting thing because our parents said that's where the jobs are. And how, about, how about a course on parenting? How about a course on marriage? About budgeting? About <laughs> How to open up an account, how to, how to just invest simply without going through a finance degree, how to just invest some money simply. I have a chapter in here, and I have a, a diagram, which I, I speak at colleges all the time. And it's really— Wait, Do you have a favorite, by the way? Um, uh, oh boy, Besides uh, Notre, Notre Dame, Dame, I know, I know. But was uh, any other school that you, you didn't see coming that was kind of cool when uh, you got there? Um Oh, I've done so many, and every university has something unique. But there's a lot it's of fun. No, not on Syracuse. It's fun Are you going looking on for the campuses. Syracuse? <laughs> well, we got to get you up there, but it's fun going on campuses. Like when I went to Harvard to speak, I mean, yeah. that was it was, was everything cool. I thought it yeah. was going to be. But my favorite is Kellogg. I no. mean, when I went to, up to Kellogg in Chicago, I just that environment. The, have that you seen program, the new buildings there? The new I, buildings, I, unbelievable. No, but it's. I mean, that, uh, that's like, wow, uh, I want to go back to school. And be, right. there, there was just a buzz going on with that, that master. Yeah. You know, just, right. Those kids were just. But, but, but here's the challenge I yeah. think we got to teach young entrepreneurs and college students. Everyone thinks they want a company or a job. We're just masking the, the real question. The real question is, what's our life's purpose? Why did our creator put us on this earth? And to oversimplify this and do a, a snippet for our listeners is I have a formula that I give college students. And I said, this is the most important formula you'll ever have in your life. You've got these big calculus and chemistry formulas. They don't mean anything. This formula, and I make them write this down. What we're all looking for, it's LM, our life mission, equals P to the fifth power plus S to the fourth plus SO squared and I'll break it down. In order to find your life's mission, how do you do that? I ask all the students, write down five of your passions. If you don't know what your passions are, ask yourself this, when's the last time I did something and lost track of time for three or four hours? 
Now you're on to something. The other thing is to find your passion. Think about the last job you did that was so much fun, you would have said, I would have done it for nothing. You know you're on to something. Add that to your strengths. Find three or four of your really good strengths. And if you don't know, ask. Ask your mom. Ask your dad. Ask your girlfriend. People will tell you. And then take those two, your passions and strengths, and add that to SO squared, two ways of how I can serve others. And I do a whole formula on this. And here's the challenge with this, Brandon, is you're not going to listen to this show and then find your life's mission. It's a process that we go through. Think about your career and my career. We've been doing what we've been doing for 35 years. We've discovered a whole new thing of writing books, of speaking, and that's kind of our new passion. But what we've done, and I shouldn't say it's our passion, it's really become our life's mission. How can you mentor and help the generation behind us become the best version of themselves? And I think your new life's mission and mine are very similar, but it's different than it was 25 years ago. And so, again, if you're stuck in life, um, I think people are just thinking it's like a stop on the bus. It's going to get off the bus and boom, it's going to be there. No, it's a process. Yeah. There's ups and downs. And one of the things for our young entrepreneurs that are listening, we think the path of success starts here and it's a direct line up. You and I both know it's ups and downs. You almost lose everything. You remortgage your house to be an entrepreneur. You put everything on the line. But there are really... And that's not for everyone. It's not for everyone. If you don't have, if you don't have the wherewithal to be able to deal with that because there is risk involved yeah, there's huge risk there's a lot of risk involved and, and it's not for everyone and it's okay yeah. but when i speak sometimes to young groups of entrepreneurs i say there are two groups in this world i respect the most one is the u.s military and i do a lot of transitional training for the navy seals i've done this for four years i spend i go four times a year and work with them and transitioning but it's the uh, elite military and entrepreneurs because both of those sectors have taken their knapsacks they've thrown o over the hill and they're all in. What'd you learn from the SEALs, from oh, being around them? That's oh, got to be amazing, right? I was going to say, if you have seven hours and seven beers, we could talk about it all day. But the number one lesson I think I've learned from the Navy SEALs, and I've had roughly 300 people go through, uh, I'm a um, part of this Honor Foundation, <clears throat> and I've spent a lot of time with them. I've spent a lot of time mentoring them in their transitions because they really struggle going from being elite military to say, hey, why don't you go sell life insurance? That's hard for them. And so um, what I've learned from them, Brandon, is this. They've created a, a big enough why in their life that they're willing to die for it. And you know what? I haven't found that. And, and I, don't think any, I, don't think, I don't think many of us do. No, but in the third book, after further review, I talk about transitions. And here's what's interesting. The five challenges of the Navy SEALs are identical to the five challenges of professional athletes in their transitions. Think about it. I'll just give you a couple. I'll take them. Number one, pro athletes and elite military Navy SEALs feel that they'll never find anything as meaningful as they're doing right now. Think of some of your athletes that have come in here. They've performed in front of tens of millions of people. Now you want me to go sell used cars? Uh, the second one is they feel their best years are behind them. I say, you're 32 years old. you got 60 more years. And here's what's interesting. But do you feel like a lot of us feel the same way? Same That's way. That's how we view a lot of people your best years. Right. Yeah. And, but the third one, and the biggest one, is they fear networking. So I do a whole session taking the fear out of networking. A pro athlete fears networking outside the locker room. Will you really care about me when I'm no longer an all-pro defensive back? And the SEALs really work well in teams. They don't know how they're going to function with normal people, because these are all elite athletes or elite warriors, how do you function with a team of people that are committed to mediocrity? So those are three of the challenges, but they're very similar between the military and pro athletes. Now, all these books on Amazon? or They're all on Amazon. You go on Amazon? Pick them up on Amazon? On Amazon, right. I, I, I would say to, you know, which one's my favorite, but obviously this is the new one, but I think all three of them are, are it's so easy to read. Your books are very easy They're to read. They're simple. They have did to be. You, did, I'm not that smart. You know that. I'm is an that Irish purpose? Catholic. Did you do it on purpose? <laughs> I, um, yeah, because, well, actually, the reason I wrote after further review, there are 100 million people, as you know, that follow football in this country. And the book was really written for people who are heavy on sports and kind of light on, I don't know if this is the right term, spirituality or life's mission or life purpose. Which is like most of the country. Yeah, like most. <laughs> but if, if you were a uh, preacher or a priest or a rabbi and you'd say, you got to do this, people say, ah, that's your role, rabbi. But I'm doing it from a um, 
a sports business person from a really practical perspective. And I think people could sit and read this book and pick something up from it. It used to be 300 pages. We edited it down to 150 because all my advisors said, people aren't gonna read a 300 page book. Keep it short. Keep it short. We had a big hard cover and they said, no. People won't put it in their briefcase. Make it a small paperback. And I said, it looks like a pamphlet. What do you, and they said, no, that's what's going to sell. So that's now, why we've made it d- simple just, and easy. Just sliding over for a second. I don't know, Ben, <clears throat> are there any questions? Or? Yeah, we got a few. Take a couple of questions, but just one quick thing. In Milwaukee, what's hot, hot in Milwaukee? Right now? Because I got a, you're like Mr. Everything. Milwaukee. Everything. Is, is it Marquette enough. basketball? Is it people foaming at the mouth about the Green Bay Packers? Are the Brewers got a buzz going? Uh, like what, what's there's going? a renaissance going on in Milwaukee right now. Um, new new uh, basketball New basketball uh, arena. arena. Tons of new development. Northwestern Mutual just built a $550 million corporate headquarters, all glass. Several businesses are moving into the into the area. Foxconn. How's Fagan doing? Has he got the whole oh, thing Peter going Fagan. on with the Bucks? Okay, let me just let's talk about Peter, I mean, Peter, Peter Fagan. He's a New York guy. How's a New York guy end up in Milwaukee? I, mean, I got I, I to ask him. I, and I know Peter really well, and I've studied his life, and I watch him all the time. Peter Fagan is doing three major major undertakings that with the Milwaukee Bucks. And one of them would burn anyone out. He's building a new $600 million arena. That's it's tough to do. Gonna be cool. the, it's going to be nice. Um, he's rebranded a team because it, the team needed to be rebranded. And he's put a new team on the, on the court. Three major undertakings. I don't know if the guy sleeps. He sleeps a couple hours a night. But I think it takes a tough New York guy to do all three of those in a Midwest so town. He's fitting club. in. He he is phenomenal. I'm a huge nice. Peter fan. In fact, I will probably see him tonight when I when I head back to Milwaukee. Yeah, this that Milwaukee is such. I mean, the people there are so nice. We'll take a couple questions. Um, this one's from Paul. What's the best lesson that you learned from the silent retreat? Hmm. That is a great question. Uh, number one. Um, God gave you two ears and one mouth. Use them in proportion. So I think I really learned how to get quiet and listen. And, and here's, what, here's what people don't understand about this. We think when we get quiet, all these great things come up. A lot of times when you get quiet and really spend a lot of time in quiet, you don't like what you see. And I use the analogy of a pond. And when the pond's rough, you know, you can't see the bottom. But when it gets calm and quiet, you can see the bottom of a pond. Sometimes you see a bicycle tire in some Coke cans. When you get quiet, you look in yourself, and sometimes you say, holy cow, what path am I going down? And, some, and it's not a bad thing. I think the minute we see pain, we want to stop. I think sometimes you got to sit in unpleasant situations and spaces in order to make major changes in your life. And one of the things I realized is I ran an investment banking firm. I didn't want to do it anymore. I used to, we used to argue and fight on deals all the time. And then like you, Brandon, I got out on the speaking circuit and I'd get 30 emails from people and say, you changed you. my life. Thank you. Made you me, yeah. It was hard for me to go back and do what I was doing before. And until I sat in quiet and really reflected on it, I'd probably still be doing the things that I, I did before. I still like the argument, you know, the fight, the grind, a little bit of the war. But I like. I want to make sure. You're a tough. Of it. You're a tough New Yorker. I, I'm just I, a simple Midwestern guy. <laughs> I think it's okay to do both. Like I mean, I can understand why because that's a nitty gritty, down and dirty, roll up your sleeves, and particularly in the M and A, you can go kill yourself for six months and come up with nothing, zero. Yeah, that's and that's heartbreaking, and it, at some point starts taking a toll. Yeah. Uh, that, but there's nothing like you know going in for me and and to a company and industry that I know nothing about, digging into it, finding out, and then giving you a completely different perspective. Right. So sometimes people say, are you bringing a sports guy to speak at this, you know, for insurance or whatever? And I'm like, exactly. If you want to be extraordinary, you need to surround yourself with different perspectives that have nothing right. to do with the industry you're in. Right. And that's a great way to learn. But most people just hang out with the people that right. do what they do, live the same way they live, and it's a great way for me to right. get to mediocrity. But, but you and I do the same thing. When we Before we go speak with a company or a group, we always ask them, give us your three biggest challenges. And you and I have been around the block a few times. We've seen a lot. We haven't seen everything. But I think based on what their challenges are, we have enough in our wheelhouse to be able to craft something yeah. to help answer those challenges. And we can do it with energy. I, lo- I love to go also to, like, to a CEO in that same industry but a different company or somebody who's really been in, in that industry a long time that maybe isn't retired and get their view of it. Right. 
Um, you know, one of the great, I did a talk for the transportation, uh, there was this transportation conference where all these people that own small limo and taxi cab services, and they were scared shit. You know, Uber is in, Lyft is in, they, oh my God, what's gonna happen? So, you know, I called up a friend of mine who was in this business, who had a whole bunch of medallions, and you know, we all know taxi cab medallions in New York are, yeah. and you know, one of the things I got out of that was that, what an unbelievable opportunity for if you had a taxi, if you had, because think about the scale, like two companies thought enough of that industry, the scale of it, to invest billions of dollars. To, right. that now, we, we didn't think of our lives about using our car service every day. Now people think of Uber as opposed to maybe buying a car. And if anything, they've now expanded the business. If you're a part of it, you're gonna grow with it. Right. You may not be the leader anymore in it, but you still could grow dramatically. Right. You know, when I look at the collectible business, yeah, all well, these teams are in it, which I like to think I had something to do with, but now the whole business has gotten so much bigger because the leagues are in it, the teams right. are in it. I'm maybe not a leader anymore in it the way I was, but the business is so much bigger. I'd rather right. have a piece of a huge business than be dominant in a small oh, little good. business. Right. You know, would you rather be on the bench for the New York Yankees or be a pitcher for the Mud and Iowa Hawkeyes? You know, and that's the question you want to ask yourself. And right. I think both situations are interesting. I'd rather be on the bench for the Yankees. Yeah, but the Mud Hens had a good year last year, Brandon. <laughs> but nobody's but, gonna see you play. You're playing in front of two or three hundred people every yeah. night. But and you're on those long bus rides. You made an yeah. interesting point though about Uber. And when you really study what I'd call we call disruptors, what disrupts an industry, and this is for all the young entrepreneurs listening, if you really look at things that have been disrupted, they've usually gotten so big so bureaucratic that someone who's nimble can come in. And so when you're the entrepreneurs Service, out there. quality, personalize yeah. it. There's always what, room. What do people want? Why, yeah. why did the cab industry, why did they suffer? Because they've got big, they got lazy, they had dirty cabs, they had rude cab drivers. Not all. For you cab drivers listening, I'm not tr throwing you under the bus. But as an industry, people got tired of it. So when people could come in and pick you up, you didn't have to worry about payment. It or was all the set. quality of car you wanted, if you want a small oh, one or a big one. Right. So, uh, but, th but think about this. As you're thinking about a product or service for the young entrepreneurs, um, what do people want? And it's part of the whole idea of the whole networking book is figuring out how to ask good questions. Ask. I do a four-step process. Listen. You know, two ears, one mouth analogy. Um, take action. And then I think if you really are on track, you got to believe and, re and receive that what you're doing to serve others will come back tenfold. So it's asking, listening, taking action, and then believing and receiving you're on the right track. Love that. Love that. That's a, that's that's a right on the, right on the money. Ben, a couple other questions. Got a question from another Brandon. Um, he says, "How have sports influenced you and helped you in your business life?" Okay, that's a great question. I think to start with that. I want to go back to my family of origin. And um, when my parents got married, they wanted to have a baby girl and name her Mary. <laughs> True story. My parents popped out nine straight boys. And the 10th you was have eight brothers. I You're have eight older brothers. Brandon, if there was any excuse for a guy to spend tens of thousands of dollars in therapy throughout his life, be the runt of an Irish Catholic litter. I'm the ninth boy. I got the crap kicked out of me from the day the day I was born. That's why I love being with you, because you kick the crap out of me all the time. I remind I you. I feel your, like I'm right at home. All I'm right. at home. <laughs> and so I grew up in a very sports-minded family. In fact, when I was born, the ninth boy, our holiday card was a baseball field with nine boys in each position. You know how to do the scoring at a baseball game? Of course. I was number nine. I was in right field and batted ninth. So people have asked a lot, why am that, I so that, aggressive? That could, weigh, that could weigh you down. Yeah, well, that's that sort of explains my dysfunctional personality. I was uh, born in right field, and some people think I'm still out there all the time. But um, <laughs> how has the question is how has um, um, the sports influenced me? Um, and and Brandon, you've been an, an inspiration. I've looked at sports and studied sports, and have tried to implement them into life lessons. Many of the things that we've talked about about hitting a home run, stealing a base 
doing the bl- basic blocking and tackling. True sacrifice. True sacrifice, working as a team. Those things are all, they all come from sports and they apply to business and they apply to, to life. What was your greatest run in sports? What did you think the best thing you accomplished when you were in the sports business? Or, the um, most, or even the most fun <coughs> thing you did in the sports business? You know, it was funny. I represented 23 pro athletes and coaches and people said, oh, I got this deal or that deal. It really wasn't. What I, when, and I don't know if anyone else did this, but I, I forced every client to fill out three forms. Very simple, ten, um, three questions, 10 responses. What's your long-term goal? What's your short-term goal? And what's your life's wish list? And you know what's funny? I probably spent 80% of the time on the wish list. And most of those were personal things that I didn't get a nickel for. But to be able to help other people get what they want, I think gives me ultimate satisfaction. Um, John Wooden also said this, and he said this to companies, and you and I talked to sales groups. I say, we don't sell anything at this business. Same at Steiner Sports. We're not a sales company. We're not a marketing company. All you do is help people get what they want. And if we can get all our employees to focus on that, we'll sell as much as we need to sell here. What are your hopes and dreams for you and your family? You know, now you're at this juncture. Like, what are your hopes and dreams? Well, I think um, I have this in the book. I think um, my hopes and dreams, and I kind of write my life's mission statement in, in here. And um, well, let me, I'll, I'll t- talk about a chapter. Chapter five is on metrics. We measure everything in life. You know that. And in football, the quarterback rating, I thought I knew what the quarterback rating was. When I wrote this book, Brandon, it's about this long. I didn't know. You know, and what do we measure in sports? Sacks, knocks downs. Hits, home hits. runs, average. Well, football does ERA. it, but baseball does it on steroids. Oh, yeah. And, you know, the whole game, money ball, is basically about statistics. So if we do that in football and baseball, we really do it in business. But here's the tough question, and this answers your questions about hopes and dreams. Um, if your life really turned out great, how would you know it, and what metrics would you use? That's a hard question. And I spent months thinking about it. I went on a retreat just answering that question. And what, what it really does, it forces you to really rewrite your mission statement. And so my mission statement, part of my hopes and dreams I wrote in the book is to inspire, much like you. We don't motivate. Motivation's like cotton candy. makes you feel good for a couple hours, and you go through the same crap you did before. And the definition of motivation is really to get people to do things they don't want to do. So if you do a good job motivating someone, all you're doing is getting people to do things they don't like to do a little bit better. You and I, Brandon, are into a different word called inspiration. Every single human being on this earth has something that's bubbling up inside them. And can we create books, talks, uh, workshops that can bring that up in people? So my life's mission statement, my hopes and dreams, is um, to inspire 100 million people and to get those people to do things they never thought they could do. That's And pe- people say, well, why do you have to have a number? Why um, because, you know, Tom Peter says what gets measured gets done. But most importantly, it determines when you get up in the morning, how you get up, what do you do, who do you spend time with, who are the people you surround yourself with. I'm here today, one, because I love you, but number two, this is a chance to go out and inspire I don't know how many people. And people say, well, how do you measure that? And 100 million, and I, I had a business coach, and we started with a million and worked our way up to 100 million. <laughs> but he said, if you inspire 100 Navy SEALs and they go out and inspire a million people, you've got your number. So <laughs> what true. I do in the book, and this is my so way really, of measuring. It is really about going to come up with a new forecast. Forecast. So I have, Brandon, I have 11 four-inch binders in my credenza and I call it my book of days. And the title on each book of days is called My Fruit Grows on Other People's Trees. So if I speak at a talk and someone sends me a note and says, that was really good, you helped me look at life differently, I take that letter and I hire someone and they organize my book of days. And what makes me sick about this, a couple years ago, I deleted like 125,000 emails not like Hillary Clinton, sorry. <laughs> but there were a lot of letters in there that I wish I hadn't deleted. I, I save all out. mine. Yeah, it's my favorite. People ask my favorite collectible. I say it's the the letters yeah. I get thanking yeah. me and, and my emails. And I save them all. And when you come to my house, you'll see I have a big uh, basket of all my favorite thank you letters. Yeah. The ones that people really uh, had sent an important message yeah. on. I love those. And that's going to be my that. night before I die. 
I want to, or a couple of days before I die, I want to read them all. I, I, I try to go through them all every 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 few months. It's, it's a real every pick, time you feel bad about it's yourself. A real, yeah, it's <laughs> a real pick me up for me, you know, to read the letters right. and remind me, you know, why I do what I do. What but, turns but, you? What, what turns you on about people? What, what's what's your favorite thing that turns you on? Um, that's a great question, and that's part of my life's mission. If I had to do my life over again, there's a side of me that says I should have gotten a PhD in behavioral psychology because what turns me on is I love figuring out what makes people tick. Why do people do what they do in life? It's, it's took me 50 years to discover it. I studied it in college. I, um, I, my major was industrial psychology, but I spent tons of time studying human behavior. My thesis, you'd get a kick out of this, was the impact, it was a sports thesis, it was the impact of physical relaxation and, and mental rehearsal on athletic performance. And I worked with a varsity basketball team on free throw shooting, how to visualize, and I had three control groups. I still have that um, thesis, and I give it to college basketball players I who are struggling with, with free throws. And was there a key to that, by the way, for all this, for all basketball players that are out there? Um, to oversimplify things. Yeah, of course. Um, um, everything helps, you know, shooting a lot helps practice. Visualizing helps, relaxation helps, but when you combine the three in the system that I created, I guarantee if you're a 50% free throw shooter and you do my system, I can get you to 80%. So if any of you coaches are listening to this, you can go to joesweeney.com and I'll come to your uh, team and that. I'll help you, help you uh, shoot better. Ben, any other questions there? A couple others? Yeah, let's take this last one from Patrick. He asks, um, what's been some of the biggest challenges that you've faced in your life and how have you overcome them? Hmm. That's that's great. Um, alcohol and vodka don't help. I really, <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Um, I think some of the challenges we all hit roadblocks, and I talked about this earlier. And we try to figure out what's next. And the main re- way I've overcome this, and I've got a chapter in both networking and moving the needle, is develop what I call my team of wingmen. The term wingmen comes from military. You got a lead pilot, and you got wingmen on each side. And the purpose of a wingman is to watch your back. And I, when I speak to companies, 600 salespeople, I said every single person in this room needs, needs your own personal board of directors. You need your wingmen. Because think about it, what's the head of a big corporation have? Something called a board of directors. The purpose of the board of directors is to help that CEO when they get stuck. And it could be in finance, it could be in industry changes. Well, all of us get stuck in life. So the question I have for all of us, where do we go? When was the, well, do you feel you were stuck when you were making the transition out of uh, doing the mergers and acquisitions? Yeah, I was really stuck. And I have a group, what I call... Was the McKay Roundtable the aha moment maybe to kind of help you sort that, that out? That think? helped me out. So I think it was an aha moment for me. Right. Even though I went in that room, I was like, Brandon, this is unbelievable what you got going. I'm like, the honest brand would have just said, I'm stuck. Yeah. I, I, I'm trying to reset. I'm trying to refire, and I, I got it. I got yeah. that out of it. Yeah. I, I, matter of fact, I'm very gr- grateful for the group to give me. Sometimes you just got to get with a group of people that you can trust. And well, well what happens? Get you, get you past the what stuff. you were experiencing, and I've experienced a lot. I use the term in the third book after further review. Many of us, when we do things for a long time, we get stale. And what develops is what I call a smoldering discontent. You're not pathological. You weren't an alcoholic. You weren't taking drugs. You weren't, you know, going to the casinos and gambling to take. But you're saying, you know what? I'm in my 50s. I'm going to be dead someday. There are a lot of things I want to do between now and the time I leave this earth. So I think to answer um, Patrick's question, uh, the biggest challenge I had was when I hit this smoldering discontent, what's next? And what did I do about it? I went back to my team of wingmen and wingwomen to help me get clarity and give me the strength and courage to take that leap and move forward. Well, thank you, Joe. Good luck with these. I mean, first of all, your books are always great, great, and they obviously do well. Go to Amazon.com. You can pick up any one of these three books. Um, always a pleasure. And I you. love having you up here anyway. This is always inspirational. But I get energy. Every time I leave here, I feel like I'm a better person, and I leave here just bubbling with energy.